<laughs> two years ago when you voted in the Electoral College because Robert, as you know, this is Robert Santagum. He was an elector in the 2016 Electoral College. And you cast the first electoral vote in history for a Native American. Uh, and that was for Fate Spotted Eagle. Before we do that, I can take a few seconds. The Electoral College is set up so that there is actually a collection of 538 people called electors. These electors are split up among the states. And whichever way the state votes, those electors are heavily encouraged to vote according to how their state voted. However, electors, as Robert will tell you, can choose to go a different direction and be what we call faithless, in which case they can vote for anybody they want. Are there any restrictions, Robert, as to who you get to vote for? Well, there's laws. <laughs> what are the laws? There's a law between Washington State, but uh, you know, I think it varies. Well, Robert, uh, first, can you take a moment to introduce yourself, and then we'll get into your business as an elector, how you became one, the decisions that you made, the whole experience of being one. First, introduce yourself, sir. Yeah, I want to wish everybody a good afternoon down there in the Ozarks. Uh, my name is Robert Satayakum. I'm up here in Washington State, uh, near uh, Tacoma, Washington. I'm a member of the Cult Tribe of Indians, and uh, that city resides in our reservation, so it's a uh, a place uh, up here, the Puget Sound, near the Salish Sea. So uh, I am a, a grandfather of 11, a father of uh, uh, six, and uh, a husband. And I have an 11-year-old living here with me, study boy. So uh, <laughs> that's a little bit about myself. So let's start at the very beginning. Um, how did you become an elector? How did that happen? Well, yeah, by showing up and showing out. Uh, uh, 2016 was uh, turning into be a, a very interesting time. Uh, a, lot, a lot of things on the landscape was happening uh, environment, uh, with the environment uh, here in the United States, uh, specifically out there towards uh, Standing Rock and the Cannonball area. Um, I showed up and showed out. I, uh, I was, uh, just to say a little bit, I was uh, the, the chair of the legislative district, the second legislative, legislative district of Washington State uh, for a few years. Uh, I was thinking about running for state representative, got a taste for it, then I, then I backed off for a little bit, and then somebody asked, hey, do you feel the burn? And I was like, what are you talking about, you know? And so I, was, uh, I started uh, following Bernie a little bit, and Old Flat was happening at that time, and uh, he started opening dialogues, had his wife down there, and so I started feeling the burn a little bit, and then the caucuses started uh, 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 happening. And uh, I just happened to show up at the, the caucus and some of the, the gripes or the first uh, the complaints that people were having that I felt the privilege of uh, complaining about having a trip down to Indian country for us to complain about yet. And so uh, I helped on a chair, said a few things about where I come from, who I am, and uh, how I feel. And next thing you know, I got a knock on the door here, you're uh, going to the next round or whatever it was. And so I went down to our state capital in Olympia said a few more words, next thing I know, I was outside the Capitol, and then I found out, like, secondhand that I became a delegate. And then at the, um, at the state convention, Washington State, uh, that's when uh, I was elected at large as a, uh, a male elector. And this was what point in the calendar? When on the calendar are you selected as an elector? In June. June, okay. And at that point, we know, we pretty much know who the candidates are. Yes. We know it's Trump, we know it's Hillary, we know those are the two major party candidates. Um, so you were selected as an elector. At that moment, you knew who the two candidates were. I know you're generally not a fan of either. Did you know you were going to be faithless in June? Or is that no. a decision that you arrived at over time? No, uh, uh, you know, I, I shared the whole story with you guys uh, you know, uh, a year ago with you and Kara, and so this, uh, I don't know if we had time to go into it, but I was just sitting there uh, talking with a friend of mine and uh, my elder from uh, across the mountains, uh, Patsy Whitefoot. There, there's two microphones, one on the left and the one on the right there. I was sitting having a conversation. Actually, I had to order my name was uh, nominated, and it was like real quickly seconded. And, and so at that time, you're supposed to uh, rise and uh, accept. and. Uh, or, or uh, deny it or decline it. And so I was, uh, I really didn't want to be an elector. 
But for, in, in, my, in my situation, when, when an elder asks you, when they're asking, they're telling you. So when they tell you to do something, you do it, you know, out of respect, because they, they're the wiser ones and you just know. And so I, there was, I couldn't have no argument at that time. And so I thought, well, I'm gonna get and accept uh, uh, this nomination. But it quickly went over to uh, the other microphone where somebody else was nominated, John Key Public, and he accepted. And so I thought it was coming back to me for me to accept and, and rise to say yay or nay. And it went to the next guy. And so I paused right there because uh, it was kind of a cycle circus that came to Washington State from Nevada, right? Uh, just a week beforehand, the chair down there suddenly shut down everything and made up her own rules. And so this kind of fiasco came to Tacoma, Washington. And so there's a lot of uh, uh, infighting going on between the Hillary and the Bernie peoples and delay tactics. So like four years prior to that, we were asked to be electors for Obama. My wife would, ended up being a, an elector for Obama. I, I didn't want to, and there's nobody standing in line for that. There's only two people, you know? And in 2016, there had to been 200 plus people that stood, in, that stood in line. This thing went on for hours and hours and hours. And, I, I came back after about an hour or so and I asked the chair, I said, hey, um, hey, Noel, I never got a shot to say yay or nay or get my speech after listening to uh, some of these people here. I think I want something to say, you know? And so she goes, Rob, oh, really? Just go sit down. So, you know, what, what are the odds anyway? So, so when it all came down to it, yeah, me, I was the elector. And so uh, let me, I was walking out of that. Let uh, me jump in at this you, point, Robert, if I could jump in at this point. Um, at what point, uh, well, before we get further uh, along in the electoral vote <coughs> and cast, at what point were you familiar with Faith Spotted Eagle? At what point did you gravitate towards her? At what point did you think this is a person that deserves a presidential vote? Oh, that was easy. Um, so I had a, a radio program here in Tacoma, Washington, KLAY, it's called Travel Talk Radio. And so for the past eight years or so, I've been having people, the shakers and movers, the people who have been on the front lines opposing or resisting these heinous ideas of continually raping our mother. And so with the Keystone XL, uh, the Bold Nebraska, uh, Cowboys and Indians, uh, the Nebraska Alliance, these different alliances that she's created and the, the bridges that she created to work with non-native peoples together and bringing uh, unification, uh, you know, common sense and uh, bringing an awareness to uh, what's occurring out in the middle of the nowhere, uh, people that have already been marginalized, people that, uh, uh, that you know, for 500 years, whatever, that she, she, her, over the years, has exemplified and showed herself to be a leader, not not an elected, but a, a you know, well-grounded uh, leader with traditions and, and values. So uh, she's been she's been on my radar for years, her and Lynona. So you have uh, just to kind of clarify and interpret what you had just said. This is a person who led the charge uh, against the Keystone Pipelines up in North Dakota, correct? And yeah. what really yeah, was yeah. kind of a special experience because she, primarily the people that protested that, I mean, obviously the protest was on behalf of Native peoples in that area, but primarily the protesters were non-Natives. They came from everywhere in the country to gather in the middle of nowhere, as far as non-Natives are concerned, up in North Dakota to protest against this. and. Uh, I think the Obama administration ended up opposing the Keystone Pipeline at the time, correct? Yeah, that's yeah. correct. So uh, her story, very, very interesting. Have you communicated with her? Did you tell her, hey, I'm going to cast you a vote? Or was she as surprised as the rest of us when you did that? Yeah, she was surprised as the rest of us. Yeah. <laughs> did you hear from her? Everybody else. <laughs> did you hear from her at any point? Pardon me? Did you hear from her at any point where she said, hey, thanks? Oh yeah, yeah. She came out to uh, a local college, Evergreen College, home of the Gooey Ducks, and uh, <laughs> uh, shared down there. So we were able to get together. I was kind of not feeling well at the time, so it was a quick, uh, quick hug, you know, smile, and uh, a picture. So, what do you say to somebody? I, I know you've thought about this a lot over the years because you were a faithless elector. What do you just say to somebody who says you subverted the will of the people of the state of Washington? Who overwhelmingly supported the Democratic candidate? Uh, just say thank you. <laughs> okay, let me rephrase. Uh, what do you say to somebody who says you subverted popular will voting for Hillary Clinton? There's no part of you that says I have. I mean, America's built on democracy. There's no part of you that's like I have derailed democracy a bit with mm -hmm. my vote. <clears throat> oh. 
You know, I had a, I had a, I had a, a whole nation of people asking me that, saying that to me, you know, and it's like, uh, uh, addicts, they're in a huge denial. They, they're, they're afraid. They don't have the courage to take the first step to admit their powers of their addiction. And so no matter what I'd say to anybody, that is the truth by me, uh, I'm a medicine person. I uh, I sacrifice a lot to uh, to uh, heal other people uh, using traditional ways like this. And so when I went back there, that's the lens I'm looking through uh, is with truth and reality. Uh, having uh, my moccasins or boots on the ground in Philadelphia at the DNC and seeing the truth, seeing that you know, because I went back there knowing it's all scripted, right? Well, we all know it's all scripted somehow, some way. But when you get back there, actually you see. The degree and the depth of, uh, of the deception uh, uh, and uh, the distortion of the truth. Because when I was walking home after we drained that, uh, uh, the Wells Fargo uh, venue, right? <clears throat> so um, we let that place empty. And so they bring the people from up above, down below, and the critics list people, actors in. On the way home, I was listening to the MSN by, by the Constitution Hall. and. I had a, a degree of credence for um, Chris Matthews, you know, and but he couldn't hear what he was saying, so I went back to the hotel room that evening. People went out to Nina, Nina Turner's and up to uh, Jill uh, Stein's campaign. People were just really pissed off, you know, and so I got to the, uh, my hotel room. I turned on the, on, the, on my MSNBC, which I cared for at that time a little bit. And, uh, it was saying that 8% of the, the Hillary uh, delegates have now come over and swung, uh, got in line and we're waiting for the other 20%. And by, ne by the end of next week, we, that should uh, occur. So I switched to CNN and it was the exact same words and then uh, over to uh, Fox. It was 80% waiting for the next 20%. I was thinking, we didn't even have 80 people. We need supporters going over to her like this. And so it was, uh, what I see behind the scenes and, and what I know is that, uh, that it, was a, it was a lie. And so I, I brought that back home and, instead of the energy about, hey, we need to get behind and, and get out there and beat the ground and, and make sure that Hillary gets uh, you know, into the White House. You know, so what happened back there was, was a lie. It was just, just more, more of it. And so uh, well, I was Robert, uh, my decision and, uh, and trying, to, to, trying, to, to, trying to express that. And so what they let down a lot of those interviews was I was trying to tell the nation that, hey, until you get somebody that can talk about something other than grabbing genitalias or being under the investigations or you know any, any sort of <clears throat> you know we, we actually have Mickey Mouse and Bozo the Clown to, 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 to pick from you know and I, I thought America was a little bit wiser than that and so I was well, saying hey why don't we just take a break until we can get some candidates to choose from. Robert I am uh, I'm sympathetic to the fact that uh, the two candidates for president in 2016 were both I don't think it's controversial to say they were poor candidates um, but I have felt that people in the past have voted for people I disagree with or are poor candidates. And you just have to respect the Democrat, the, the, the choice of the people, do you not? I mean, uh, by well, cast, I, I asked by my cast, elder who, uh, who uh, nominated me, I said, why did you do that to me? And she says, <laughs> you know, because of who you are, your character, your metal, and how you carry yourself. She goes, remember, you know, she goes, don't be a political, uh, or a, I'll, I'll leave that part out, but what she had said was, Remember, it's the will of the people. I said, exactly. I said, the will of the people. I know we, we endorsed him at our state convention. That's the will of the people. Decisions are made by those who show up and show out. You get off the menu and at the table, the fork and knife you had by showing up and showing out, you know, and, and that's exactly what happened. And after, so what I see, it sounds to me like uh, this, this place, this company called America wanted uh, a woman for president. They wanted a leader. And that's what I, exactly what I voted for. A face party you know, is a leader. Not, she is not an elected. We knew exactly you know, what, what, what he was going to do. He expressed before he became that, yes, we're going to use eminent domain. That those pipelines don't go 10 feet without eminent domain. Here's how we're going to make America great. Canada is going to pay for it. You know, so we knew exactly this guy, what this guy was. You know, but, but we knew with Hillary, it was just going deeper like this. And, the, remember in 2016, it, it didn't start off too fair, did it? We had that thing called these super delegates, so the, 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 the scales are already tilted, you know. Well, Robert, so, the um, do you like the Electoral College? Do you think it's a good idea? No. Why is it a bad idea? Is it because there are people who can make decisions other than the ones 
than the general public have made. Why do you think it's a bad idea? Yeah, I think it's our common sense. You know, it's like, you know, <coughs> you get five people, hey, who wants to jump off the cliff? Raise your hand, you know, there's the vote. Pretty simple. You know, you don't need to go have an electoral college come and change that vote. You know, it's pretty, it's just common sense. And I think this country's got a way off course of that or is, is lost sight of that, you know. So after we get done talking with you, I'm going to yell at my friend, uh, Bill Prince, for liking the electoral college. Because I agree with you. It should, yeah. when we're voting for the president, we right. should go popular vote. Right. But that's what, lucky you, Washington chose the person that won the popular vote, which was Hillary Clinton. So I, I struggle with your decision. I respect the passion with which you made the decision. You and I spoke last year or earlier this year, and you were uh, so passionate about the choice that you made. But I, I got to say, I disagree with it because the people did speak. And I agree, maybe it wasn't the best choice, but the people spoke. They said Hillary Clinton should be president. And yet the Electoral College went the other way, yourself included. So I, I have trouble jiving those ideals that you express very passionately with the decision that you made. Yeah, that's uh, a lot of times I ask people, I said, well, do you sacrifice a night and an all morning to pray with me? You know, I have those six children I talked about, you know, and I have 11 grandchildren. When Bernie back then says, you know, hey, we're not gonna do it, let's go support her. In that moment, I could see through my hand. And before Stanley Rock blew up and erupted next to me was a delegate from uh, North Dakota and Chase Ironeyes, I was running for the Senate next to me, and then there was a grandpa and his granddaughter. So there's four delegates from that Standing Rock Cannonball uh, uh, reservation that were next to me. In that moment, she was standing up. You know, there were only three percent what was left from what of a 100 percent. Which I'm looking at that classroom. It looks like everybody's enjoying 100 percent of their peoples, whereas we're just three percent, like the insects, the plants, and the animals that are left on this earth. And so when this lady was was saying, "Hey, it's all going to be okay. Hillary's going to." make it okay for us. I asked her, hey, do you drink oil? Does your agriculture drink oil? Does your livestock drink oil? Because these relatives here do. I said, I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm surprised that you can still see me, That I, I, because I can see through my hands. I, when I get back home from Philadelphia, I wonder if I'm going to be able to see my children, because their generation is now is now vanishing. And I, with my, my 11 grandchildren, I'm going to have to light a sage stick and use the smoke to find my Casper the friendly ghost called my grandchildren because their generation is now gone. All right, uh, Robert, uh, if it's okay with you, I would love to open up the room so that anybody here who's interested might have a comment for you or a question for you, if that's okay, sir. Absolutely. All right, anybody have a comment or a question about anything he said, any thoughts he's expressed? Let's start back in the room. Your name again? Gabriel. Gabriel would like to, has a comment or a question, sir. I uh, hope. Uh, Brother Means said, uh, Russell Means said that we're institutionalized as a, as a nation, as uh, other brothers and sisters natives, and that the new modern Indian is uh, American citizens now. Uh, our people don't have a vote. You know, uh, my people are Muscalero, Apache, and we're the same way as your people in Washington. We're looked down as the lower class citizen uh, in impoverished areas. Uh, our poverty stands different than Brooklyn, than Los Angeles. Our votes don't count. Um, even though there is 200 plus thousand of our people, those 200 plus thousand votes don't count. Um, minority is what we're not. You know, even our brothers, the Hispanics, which they're mestizo, their votes don't count because they're looked on as illegals or were illegals or we pick the cotton, we pick the fields. They don't vote like us. They don't think like us. They're not, they're not going to work the fields. They're not going to be on those voting fields in, in, in in uh, California, they're not going to be working the farms like our people do still daily. Um, we're not, what you did was open up another branch for our people to succeed. Uh, in what way? In, in what way? Mm -hmm. We've never had a vote. 500 years, like you said, we haven't had a vote. They tried to, they tried to kill us in 18, 1852, 1842 by killing all our buffalo pushing my people from Washington to, the, to New Mexico. We, we originally came from, from Washington and ended up on a res in, in Rio Dosa, New Mexico. You know, we got the Tiwa, the, the Apache, the Hopi, the Navajo. We're all brothers of one nation, but we separate ourselves by a piece of land. What do you say, Robert, to comments from uh, our friend here who say that your 
one electoral vote, but the first in American, Native American community, the respect and uh, an elevation of status that they've lacked in all of American history. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah. Robert, what do you say to how your electoral vote has impacted the Native American community? He did something Russell Means couldn't do. Russell yeah, Means tried. Uh, it just that's just how the creator i don't know you know it's just how the the, the creator would i don't know you know hopefully when we look back on hopefully we'll have some seven, seven generations we can look back on it and say hey for for what you know there was once a time where in american history common sense showed up and showed out you know where they had a chance to be a tether ball and bind around and unify around some common sense that this country needed because the last two years you know there's, there's been nobody with a strong or firm hand on the wheel so in any country a little is always a lot you know and uh uh as, as over the years we saw the always the vote the white boy vote and then the negro vote and now it's the lgbtq vote and then uh, the latino vote exactly. and never a native american indian native vote you know what i'm saying so you know one thing that's I actually understand where they there's a sense of pride in that that hey for once we uh we mattered yeah, and there's actually, um, if you read the Constitution, the clause that we use historically to say how bad civil rights were at the turn at the beginning of the country is the three fifths clause. Yeah, we're part of that. Um, you guys actually, Native Americans, if I could just branch you. Yeah. Native Americans actually have a zero fifths clause. Yeah. In the Constitution, because populations were to be counted, white people count as one. Mm -hmm. Non-free people count as three fifths, yeah. excepted for uh, excepted Native. for Native Americans, mm -hmm. which got zero representation. So there's no attention ever paid to the zero fifths clause, the zero person yeah. clause, relative to three. I guess I, uh, uh, you know, I, I hadn't thought of your electoral vote as a. I knew it was a protest vote, but I didn't know it was a protest vote on behalf of a Native American population that feels underserved. Uh, one moment, Robert Hunter. Do you have a question or a comment? Is there anything that the U.S. government could do now no. to fix what we've done for years? Give the land back. We passed we reparations. Give the land back, but they were obviously we, we buy it back every day when we go buy soil to plant our fields. What could, in your opinion, we'll end on this question? He smiles. It's a truth. Uh, Robert, in your opinion, how is there any way in 2018 the American government can act in a way that? your community would see fit as fully respecting you folks and your rights? Oh, no. It's never even admitted anything has occurred, so I don't know. The empire is too big for itself right now, so it's just a matter of uh, the day I know it's going on. The Bible says so, and that said, it also says pride cometh before the fall, so it, uh, I don't know. You know, it's uh, we just got to keep leaning into it. You know, we hold on to our traditions and our values, and we, we know what's at stake, and we that's why we listen to our to our elders, you know, to remember, to remember, you know, that's what also that's all I was doing, you know, my protocols, listening to my elder, I followed my instructions, it led me the right way. You got America now has an example of what a what a true matriarch and a true leader really does and looks like and feels like, you know. Uh, Robert, one moment, please. Anybody else have any uh, anybody else have any comments, questions, anything for our guest speaker today? I have a question. We have a question, Robert. Hi, I don't think you can see me, I'm over here. <laughs> you can't see most of us. Um, this might be taking it in a slightly different direction from what we've had so far, but I'm, I'm just curious if after your decision to um, be faithless, is that what it's called, um, were you subject to any type of criticism that wasn't political, that was more directed at your race? Did people say terrible things because of the choice that you made? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that happened uh, after the, probably about 20 minutes after I gave my uh, interview with the Associated Press from Facebook Hill and Standing Rock. I thought it was just going to be in the newspaper. So I told my wife, uh, well, tomorrow I'm going to get ready for a, a hex storm to hit. And so it got cold, and we went to the, the casino, and that's where you get some more reception and charge your phones. And, and, uh, and I was standing in that lobby because we left. It was about 20, 30 minutes later. Also, my phone went off like um, 
like a casino machine. I just hit the jackpot <laughs> the notifications of how I could go screw myself and how many different ways. And, and it came in where I ended up, uh, my, my mom said, you're all over television, you better get home. So we, we, we made our way back from Standing Rock. And the phone was just going off one after another with all the hate. And uh, that's why I found that love does conquer all because I picked out five of the worst things that I never considered I, beyond my imagination of, of hate. And I, I reached out to them and I, I was just saying, thank you, I appreciate you, you, you for expressing yourself to me. Your, your feelings matter to me. I, I understand you. I love you. Send. And it, more hate. So anyway, five people like that. We got, got five friend, friend requests. And when I pulled in my driveway, it was like, I told my wife, love does conquer all. And that was like 11 o'clock. I got my family upstairs. And I came back to unload my, uh, my, uh, my vehicle. There was uh, a car out there. Out, right, well, I look out where the car was. It was out there beside my, uh, my, my driveway. And this is like 11 o'clock at night. And there was, so I felt, so I turned off all the lights on my house. And eventually I ended up, uh, um, because prior to that, after in September, when I talked to Politico, neighbors were coming into my driveway. Or if I was outside, they were kind of attacking me verbally. And then uh, they pulled into my driveway. The police came to my house. 11, 11 o'clock at night and harassed me. And then um, I ended up in the safe house though. Yeah. And I got back from Stanley Rock. So I was in the safe house for four days up until the election night. And that was a pretty interesting night too, you know. So it was, uh, it was very interesting to hide my family, uh, the protocols and the safety and stuff like that in preparation to go black in case Hillary did win. And then it would have been a whole different kind of story for, my, for myself. So it was, a, it, it was what it was. It was harrowing, it was exciting. It was all wrong. You know, and uh, it was a, uh, it is what it is, you know. Uh, Robert Santiacum, a faithless elector of the 2016 Electoral College. You, you are one of a kind. <laughs> you're, you're just a different kind of bird, sir. I'm a Native American. <laughs> there you go. Thank you so much. Round of applause for our next speaker. Thank you so much, sir. Take care. Yeah, you too. All right, so I would like to pivot for a moment with my uh, friend Bill Prince, who's in the back of the room here, and talk. You can move up there. Want me to move up front? Yes, fine. Yeah, right there we have an open chair. Oh, you can be in the. Yes. And um, <laughs> if you don't mind, yeah, I was just saying. We just argue through in. Hunter. I'll just argue. argue. We're have a discussion. A new <laughs> argue. <laughs> I'm no, I'm just kidding. We, I want to have a. This, I want to have a, a a great civil discussion. Uh, that. Uh, <laughs> That was a really, really interesting experience. And earlier this semester, I brought in Cherry Warren, who was an elector on behalf of Missouri in the 2016 presidential election. And you, sorry. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yes. Um, both times I spoke to these electors, I come away, i got to be honest with you, I come away more depressed than encouraged about democracy in America for presidential elections because... Uh, I don't feel like the answers I'm getting in defense of the Electoral College or the electoral votes that they cast are satisfying. Is it, uh, tell me why I should feel okay about the Electoral College, in your opinion. Well, that's a hard question, and, and again, I don't want to be, you know, presumably defending something that was written well over 200 years ago, and we need to keep doing it because that's the way we've always done it. <laughs> yeah. but, you know, it's, it, it's the rules of the game, um, you know, that, that, that we have. And our founders, when they wrote the Constitution, never intended that our president be elected democratically. Um, it was, a, I, I think it was, it was written as, uh, again, many, like many of the things in the original Constitution as a compromise. And our, our president is elected not democratically, but more as a result of a, of a federalist Republican sort of a system. And, and I sort of like to think of the presidential election not so much as a national presidential election, more as uh, 50 states electing the president. Um, and uh, I often wonder uh, if, you know, if we would be having these discussions about whether the Electoral College should stay or should it go, if the shoe was on the other foot. Um, in other words, if, if Clinton had won the Electoral College and lost the popular vote, or if uh, Gore had won the Electoral College and lost the, the popular vote. Um, the story that I always tell you know, Andy about, or Andrew about, uh, that always kind of keeps my faith in the Electoral College is, is I think back to 
2008, the Sunday before the election, uh, where Obama and, uh, and Biden were running against uh, McCain and Palin, and I always ask my students, I said, does anybody know where Barack Obama was that Sunday night? Right before the election. Before the Sunday before the Tuesday election. Does anybody know? Probably praying. Well, maybe not. He, he, he was at JFK High School, or he was at Parkview High School in John F. Kennedy Stadium. Um, now, what in the world was he doing there? Why wasn't he in Chicago, Illinois, or Los Angeles, California, or New York City? Well, he was there because the rules of the game tell us that the person who is going to be the president is not the person who gets the most votes but rather the person who gets the most electoral votes. And that was a year that Missouri, uh, you know, red, red Missouri, um, was, was thought to be in play and that our electoral votes uh, might well go to that coalition that would end up ultimately electing uh, President Obama, which he didn't come to need and he didn't get anyway. I think if we looked at electing the president just based on popular vote, um, then I think you're going to see the elections taking place on the West Coast, on the East Coast, and, uh, and, and in the major uh, Midwest cities. And what? Then, that's where the people are. Um, you know, and, um, you know, and again, I think that was something, now again, our, our founding fathers, I'm not sure could envision a country of 320 million people at the time that, that they put this electoral college together. They had some doubts themselves whether it was going to work. If you, if you read uh, a lot uh, about what the founding fathers were writing around this time and debating about it, most of them, I think, thought that more often than not the election was going to end up getting thrown to Congress. That, that most of the time they weren't going to get somebody who had the majority of the votes and it was going to get thrown to Congress most of, of, of the time. But, you know, look at what happened to Hillary Clinton this last time. She lost, at least in my opinion, and, and I will tell you I am no fan of the current president, but, but she lost, in my opinion, because she ran a terrible campaign. To be the president of the United States, you have to put a coalition of different interests together. I don't think she did that. I think she, she spent most of her time in those states where she was already going to win and didn't spend enough of her time in the, the Pennsylvanias and the Wisconsins and, and those states where she lost. And so, you know, while you don't have to be happy about the outcome, I'm pretty happy with the process. And, and, and I think the more I, I thought about it and got ready for the debate, the happier I got about the process. So <laughs> Let me ask you about yeah. that process because I think you raise a really good point thanks to the Electoral College, states that aren't as big in population, some states that aren't as big in population, get emphasized in ways we wouldn't see. Like Missouri in 08, or Wisconsin, stuff like that. States that wouldn't normally get a ton of attention. I think that's fair. Here's the problem with the Electoral College, in my opinion. If you take the number of electors every state has, and you divide it, I don't know what the math is, actually if you take the population of the state and then divide it by the number of electoral college votes that state gets. You end up with populous states like California. A Californian has like, their vote is like one four hundredth or something like that of what a voter in Wisconsin is because the electoral college empowers those rural states more. I like the idea of promoting rural states, but at the expense of devaluing tens of millions of Americans and their votes, you know, I should be one person, one man, shouldn't it? Or one man, one vote, shouldn't it? It should be, but that's that's not our work. Uh, that's well, not the system that our founders put together. Ma'am. If it was one one man, one vote, then the majority would always rule, would it not? Like would. in cases like that means the residents folks would count and they don't. What's that one more time? That means the residents votes to count and they don't. Like I'm saying like residents votes? The residents, like our reservation, their votes don't count. Because oh, we're not a common citizen. We don't have the same rights you guys do. We don't well, have the same look. look there is a whole debate we could have about voting rights for Native Americans, and there have been some recent controversies about that. I think Bill would agree with me that anybody who lives within the country fairly is born should be the right to vote. 
just staying on the focus specifically on what Sydney's bringing. Can you reinforce your point again? Can you make that point again? Well, just if it's one man, one vote, then the majority would always rule. But that's not necessarily fair, in my opinion, because what would be best for California is most certainly not going to be best for Missouri or like Wisconsin or New York, even for that matter. So, I mean, it, aren't there different? I mean, I know there's different uh, numbers of electors per state, and there's a census every 10 years just to recalculate the population and everything. So that's why I thought that it would be definitely necessary, just because it seems like the states with the most people, they would always rule with their opinion. Sir? So, yeah, but then, I mean, what if, well, I just completely lost my point. Well, uh, um, when you remember it, please raise your hand again, because <laughs> yeah. I really want to respond to this point. Um, and, and I want Bill to weigh in on, on Sydney's oh. point as well. I think it's a great point. Um, the idea that if you go straight popular vote, presidential elections, big states will make the calls on behalf of the country, including the small states. What's California? Why is their vote? vote why should they decide what's best for you know North Dakota? But let's spin it the other way. Why should Missouri decide what's best for California? I feel like you're tipping the scales too much the other way. Do you, do you disagree with me, or do you think Sydney makes more sense? I, I think Sydney makes more sense. Uh, I, I mean, I think you have to, again, it, it's coalition building. And, and coalitions change. Um, California used to be a red, red state. It is a blue, blue state now. Texas, you know, used to be a you know, a red red. State. It's becoming a, a a blue blue state. So people's interests within the states change. People's interests across the country change. And to become the president, at least under the electoral college system, then you know you better win California. You better win North Dakota. You better win Missouri. You've got to put coalitions of all of those folks together. And to to get people in California and Missouri and North Dakota to agree on things, you better compromise. You better not take crazy positions. Now, does that always work? No. But, but, but again, I think if, if you simply say we're going to go with the, the candidate who gets the most popular votes, then I do think you run the risk of, of, of sort of that tyranny of the majority. And, and, you know, you're talking about kind of devaluing votes. You know, I guess it becomes at that point in time, well, okay, you know, then whose vote do you devalue? Do you devalue folks in California or do you devalue the folks in the far from North Dakota? Do you not agree that um, – who are you talking to? Um, just anybody, really. Okay. <laughs> just, I mean, people that – People that are starting to believe that their vote doesn't count, do you believe, I, I mean, I, I think that, that part of that is because of the Electoral College, because you see things like we had in, you know, 2008 and 2000, or, you know, this last, elect, last election, the majority of people voted for a candidate, but then the other candidate didn't, you know, won, or, you know, whatever. So I feel like that's why a lot of people, in the presidential campaign at least, maybe not midterms, that's why voter, um, you know, voter percentage is, is a lot lower than you know, than what it needs to be. I mean, do you, what do you? I agree with what you're saying there, but I guess I would say that, you know, whose fault is that? I mean, you know, the, the system has been with us for, you know, since 1787 and with some amendments, I think it's a general lack of understanding on the part of the public that, you know, when I'm pulling that lever for Clinton and, and Kane or, or Trump and, and uh, Pence, and I'm really not pulling the lever for them, I'm pulling it for an elector. So, uh, you know, uh, it, you know, you, you can't say that the, 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 the um, Bush in 2000 election or the Trump uh, in 2016 election was illegitimate. They played by the rules and they won by the rules that, that the founders set up. Now, if you want to change the rules, you know, I think that's what you can do. Hunter? Let's go with him first. Okay, sure. But I'm from California. I was born and raised there. And I'm, I'm, in, I'm probably older than a lot of people here. Uh, our I votes got you. in California. I got you on that one. Uh, our, 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 you too. Our, <laughs> vote, our votes don't really count the same way other people. It's like if you're from the ghetto or you got a felony, majority of people that are in Southern California, say Southern California or certain parts of Northern California or in Central Valley that are citizens or the majority of Central Valley might be immigrants, they can't vote, so they have no voice. But they're the people who are keeping California alive. The people that are in the ghetto are either Fel felons or have prior history with with you know um, crimes so like that so their their votes don't count they, they can't vote uh, so we lose a lot of the, the the popular Hispanic and African American or poppers people in the poverty level to vote because they have no voice because they're they're not they're not put in that category to re vote or become socialized citizens again 
or the immigrants are not put in put in the, the position to vote because there's no possible way for them to get a green card but they're the ones keeping california stable they're the ones on the lower level of the working force it's not all hollywood glitz and glamour it's not all calabasas is on fire on malibu it's not that it's those guys who are felons who became a firefighter because they went to prison and joined fire camp they're allowed to vote because they're firefighter now because they work for the government but the guy who couldn't do it because he went and stole a car when he was 16 to you know act a fool he can't vote uh, you know so you lose you lose thousands of votes hunter go ahead i like that point um but is the president not elected by populist vote by populist vote of each state so they're getting each state but they're also getting the popular vote within each state to get like really bad at explaining things no, I, know, I know what you're saying, saying is that the president that has to get the popular vote in a state to win the state correct so is it not protecting the minority while also somewhat protecting the majority as well the valued majority are you talking about the ones of money electoral college or electoral i'm yeah. for the electoral college. yeah you know and and and, and again I, I would submit that uh, you know, and, and as the speaker was talking about, with super delegates and all, you know, that that the the purity of the electoral college, if there is such a thing, I think has been subverted and 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 and, uh, and mucked up by the parties and and you know, and that sort of thing. I mean, uh, I always have trouble, uh, you know, with these folks being called faithless, uh, you know, electorate because you know because you know if you think about what the original version of, of the electoral college was. It, you know, at least in theory, I know it's, it's maybe never played out this way because I think, in the, it, as I read somewhere in the history of our country, this this fellow may be one of nine or ten that have gone against that. There aren't that many faithless electors in, in the whole history of our country. So, uh, you know, he's kind of a, a, a rare guy. But you know, th their goal is to kind of, you know, again, if you go back to 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 the elitism in which our country emerged from, um, you know, and I know that a lot of people don't like to hear that, but, you know, we emerged from elitism. Why? Well, because our founders didn't trust us but to elect one part of government initially, and that was the House of Representatives. And so I think their idea was, is that, you know, well, we'll you know, we're going to have some, some smart people, good and true, they will tell us, uh, and again, at the founding, white, property-owning males, yeah. um, you know, tell us who the best person is, is going to be. Well, we all found 2000, Robin Hood. 2000, uh, 2016 was weird. It was. We weird. had like six or seven faithless electors. Yeah. Um, if, here's, here's why I think the Electoral College is a bad idea, and it's because maybe I'm not very pragmatic. I don't look at the system as it is, and I'm like, well, it could be worse. I look at it as, if I had to elect the president and I was just starting from scratch, what do I think the best system would be? Now, in Missouri, we don't have an electoral college within Missouri to balance out Nixa against St. Louis. So we have decided in Missouri that popular vote's good enough for a governor. Same thing for a senator, although obviously that changed. That was initially not popular vote, but now it is. Yeah. And um, same thing with mayor. We don't emphasize one neighborhood <laughs> to make sure a more populous neighborhood gets balanced out. And I don't see why when we get to the presidential level, that's how it's got to be. If I had to start from scratch, have you ever thought about that? Uh, if you had to start from scratch, would you end up with a system that looks and smells like this, or would you end up something that was more popular vote based? Because I think that's probably where I would end up if I just started with a white sheet of paper. Here, elect the president. I don't know that I trust the majority in a lot of things, but maybe that's just the anarchist in the, um, you know. I, I don't know, you know, but again, each state, I mean, is left to its own device. Uh, the Constitution really doesn't say that much about, you know, the only thing it says about who can't be electors or how they're selected is they can't be elected officials because, again, they didn't want to create a, a permanent vicious circle of elected officials, you know, appointing other elected officials. Um, but I mean, you know, is it is it Nebraska and Maine that, um, or, or two states that, um, there you know, they delegate the, the the electors by districts and That's things correct. like that? And, and I mean, I think you could could do some refinements to. And again, each state I think is free to do this, um, and I think they have pretty wide discretion again, so long as they don't start violating you know constitutional equal protection provisions or things like that. But I think it could be fine tuned so that. Um, you know, that, that maybe it could be a little more quote unquote. Dumb. Would you, if you're emperor of America, would you, uh, which is weird that I'm asking you to fix democracy as an emperor, but <laughs> would you, uh, would you Nebraska eyes all 50 states for the electoral college? 
or no, Nebraska, just in case anybody doesn't know, Nebraska can split up their electoral votes based on their congressional districts. Mm -hmm. And so can Maine. Every other state does not. We are winner take all. Yeah, and I think those two states did that relatively recently. The 90s, maybe? Like 80s uh, or 90s. Maine did it in 16. I was say, and then Nebraska did it in 08. Yeah, yeah, Nebraska did it in 08. Yeah. yeah, so it hasn't been that long. But, you know, I, I, I think that would, would make some sense. Sir? Uh, I think the, the big problem with the popular vote. Yeah. Is the general lack of education of the general populace it, because of the ads that are constantly spewed in our faces, we don't really get to know the actual policies of the people. We just get to know the lies and the slander that they throw at the other candidate and the the controversies they're wanting to bring up about the other candidate. So we don't really get to know that. So I think it's a good idea for us to have someone who's representing us who knows a bit more about the subject. So I don't want to take a ton of time on this point, and I think you raise an important point about perhaps being undereducated about the election, though I want you to weigh in on this as well. I remember in 2004, the first presidential election I gave a flip about, I was waiting in line in Kansas City with a long list of issues, and I read everything, and I was just standing there with my sweaty hands. I had a tie on. I don't know why I thought I was supposed to wear a tie and vote. And, uh, it's in the Constitution. It, 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 I, I did not read that part. <laughs> anyway, so... Uh, uh, and I remember standing there, and the guy behind me was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. both these guys are the same. Bush seems like he'd be pretty cool, though. So vote for him, and I'm like, this dude's vote could be canceling mine out. And I don't know how you can moderate that. Everything in the, all the amendments open the door for more and more people to vote. There's no qualification on it. Awareness level, nor should there be. What are your thoughts on that, if you have any? Yeah, boy, yeah, that, that's a hard, you know, I, was, I think of the Facebook meme, you know, this this go around where a guy was walking out of a Home Depot store or something, and he, he had purchased a dolly, and but he had his dolly in a grocery cart, was pushing his dolly in a grocery cart, you know, and something to that, you know, this guy's vote counts the same as, as, as yours, you know, but, um, you know, we, we tried to, you know, uh, you know, you know, I, I think the way our, our founders created this system was, you know, we get to go in there and pull a lever, whether that lever is being pulled based on full research or, or we like the guy's name um, or the lady's name. Um, I don't know of any way that you can go qualify, you know, pre-qualify voters. And again, I think that's a little bit of what the founders were afraid of, you know, with, and why we have to go college. Well, what's your name, sir? Uh, Brendan. Brendan? Uh, with an A. Okay, so that was actually what the Constitution, if you read the Federalist Papers, that's what the Constitution was actually designed to do, was to avoid the plebs who don't know crap and just have the elites, which at the time was the Electoral College designed to be, uh, call the shots for the rest of us. So that's a, at least you share that perspective with like Alexander Hamilton, I'll tell you. Uh, um, one last question, if you can make it snappy so that Bill or me can shoot you down. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so. What about the uh, coalition of states that are coming together to say that they're going to put their electoral votes uh, towards the popular vote of their state, mm -hmm. so that when enough states kind of kick in, that all 270 from the 270, 270 uh, kick in uh, once the popular vote's been reached to effectively overrule the electoral college and kind of turn it back to a popular vote without needing to through a constitutional amendment or anything. Okay, have you been plugged in on that? About 10 to 12 states, all of them, for obvious reasons, heavily democratic states, 10 to 12 states have said, let's just go straight, let's just ignore whatever our state, let's go straight for the popular vote winner. Your thoughts? I think under the, um, the, the, the law as it currently stands now, that's perfectly legal. I think the states can agree to do that. Um, you know, um, again, uh, you know, and I always, I always tell my classes, you know, uh, don't look for consistency in politics because politics always comes down to whose ox is getting gored. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think the Democrats found that out when, you know, they, they made some changes in the Senate uh, to how nominations occurred and things of that nature. And uh, I sometimes be careful what you, you know, what you ask for, you might, you might get it. And, and if the shoe's on the foot, you know, the, the other party's like, God, I wish we had that electoral college back, yeah. you know, so. All right. Uh, sorry for anybody who feels like a comment that they had got squashed as we are tight on time. I'm going to throw to Kara at this moment just to wrap us up with a couple yeah. shopkeeping business items. Yeah. Um, really, before you leave, we need the sign-up sheet. Um, also, uh, we'll be sending a remind uh, for the Five Spice. If you're interested in that, um, just reply back with the RSVP. Yes, it'll be really fun. 
Um, it will be free, but only there's only 20 size, spots. Dress. Casual. Ball gowns. As long as you're not naked, I guess. Oh. Casual. <laughs> and um, we have like seven, maybe seven or eight spots left. Um, all striped sweaters. Yeah. Let's not. Let's not. We uh, could do ugly Christmas sweater. We could do ugly. Yeah, that's what I suggest. We have no comment. All as right. President. We'll talk. We'll talk. I, but I, that's I really all I had as far as housekeeping. Uh, we also have a boat. Hey, we do. So who here? We got an opening at the deep slot. Yes. Uh, who is interested in being a vice president of politically active? Here? <laughs> Constitutionally, you can only. Hunter, you are you're not. Vice. You're saying president. If you are so. interested in serving as vice president of politically active, please raise your hand. We'll have ourselves just a quick reset vote on anybody. We got two people interested. Go what, away. What I'm just you? <laughs> vice presidential duties. <coughs> hey. Twenty seconds. Sure. Uh, VP duties are going to help out uh, with Hunter. Basically, we're going to be a, a cabinet that's going to discuss agendas for meetings, committees, voter education drives, and community engagement. So it's going to be someone who's going to meet with us probably on a monthly basis at least and just help organize what you've seen here today. Yeah. What are the qualifications of those who don't have a vote in the state? Somebody that, well, fortunately, we out operate outside the jurisdiction of Missouri. And we do. That's what I'm saying. So if, my, if, my, if somebody sees on me wanting to go for this, yeah. my just opinion doesn't, me. I can't. You well, were, as this is its own. Here's what I'm yeah. saying, but uh, my, 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 my opinion wouldn't matter regardless, technically, to the state. Unless or you whatever. encourage others. All right, so uh, yeah. here's what I'm saying. We have two people, Sydney and Garrett, are interested. I'm uh, interested, too. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, 20 seconds, 20 vote. seconds, 20 seconds. Yep. Why should you be beat? Um, well, like I said, I'm Garrett Moeller. Um, I'm very politically active. <coughs> um, for, I've been for about five years now. Um, I really enjoy this club so far, and I enjoy talking to all you guys and just having these meetings. And so I'd like to continue. It, so. Thank you so much, Sydney. Okay. Um, well, I'm Sydney Kaminsky, and honestly, I just feel like I see more for this group as far as like pushing legislations. One day, maybe if we can all agree on something. Um, I'm very politically active, really passionate about politics in America, American citizens. Sir, bring us home. Uh, my name is Gabriel. Um, I think America had core values when it started before and after it being taken into the, the, the new millennium. Um, we were designed on leaving tyranny, not to keep up with tyranny. Um, and I think that everybody has a voice. One man can't change a nation. Okay, thank you so much. Since you all have decided to submit yourself to the popular will, I'm sure you are ready for the bruising results, whatever it may be. Thicken your skins, all three of you. So, you know, I'm not allowed to vote. Yes, of course you're allowed to vote. Yes, you're allowed to vote. Well, why don't we? Have, I love eating. Can we vote so, for Yes, you may vote for Yes, you can. Uh, you may not be faithless, whatever that means. So, uh, right. in the context of this group. So, first of all, who is interested in having Garrett serve as vice president under um, uh, under Hunter? Who is interested? Hands down. Who is interested in having Sydney serve as vice president? Hands down. Who is interested in having our, one more time your name? Gabriel. Gabriel, sir, as vice president. Please raise your hand. All right, and due to popular vote, we'll have Sydney, sir. And maybe we can find other guys for the other folks that are interested as well. Yeah. Uh, anything else we got to cover? Again. No, that's it. Thank you so much. Grab a slice in your wagon if you want. And yes, we'll see take you the pizza. In January. Enjoy your Thank time. you, everyone, for coming. <laughs> Please, if you can, come to Fire Spice. I'll send another